We often view gardens as romantic settings. It's a great place to get married. Perfumes designed to attract a mate use the fragrance of flowers. And what's more romantic than a dozen roses? Now, it's not for no reason that there's this association between gardens and romance, because a garden is a setting that's just laden with sex. It just oozes sex. Everything in the garden is about sex. Each and every creature's drive to project its genes into the future. And the season is short, so each plant has to use all of the tools at its disposal. At any given time, this place is awash in seduction, deceit, and outright manipulation. Plants need to get together for sex to happen. Unlike humans, though, they can't go out to a bar to meet a mate. They're grounded to one spot, so often the only way they can perform sex is to get someone else involved. What plants do is dupe creatures like insects or birds into carrying out their sexual acts for them. On any given day in your garden, two different flowers and an insect intermediary join together to create a classic menage a trois. As the bumblebee dives headfirst into this blue lobelia in search of nectar, a little arm comes down and brushes pollen onto his back. The flower cleverly places the pollen in a spot just beyond the reach of the bumblebee so he can't rub it off before going on to the next flower to drop off his load. Now there has to be something in it for the insect. What do they care or even know about plant sex? Often the treat is nectar, a sweet fluid rich in sugars and sometimes even in amino Garden, the flowers are really there mainly just as a way to dupe other creatures into performing their sexual functions for them. Now, they do that lots of different ways. When you look at flowers, sometimes they're really quite showy colors, you know, very brightly colored petals, and they're held way up high up on stems and everything, so they're really obvious. And that's mainly so that creatures flying by can't help but be attracted to them. And plants are, in fact, completely blatant about this sort of thing. They are advertising. Now, to make this work really effectively, often plants are very selective about what colors they'll use. 
for example, most insects don't see very well in the color range of red and purple. So often what plants do is have bright colors like whites and yellows and pinks and that to attract a lot of insects. And in fact, insects probably don't even see these plants in the same color range that we do because they have a different form of vision. Other flowers actually have colors that are not particularly attractive to insects, often they're bright reds, and the reds will attract other creatures like hummingbirds, which see much better in the red color range. It also could be a useful color for attracting butterflies that see better in the red range. Not only do flowers use these flamboyant colors, but they use them in very specific ways. Often they'll have patterns in the petals. You can see flowers that have a fringe that's a different color, like an arrow pointing to where the nectar is. They're nectar guides. Essentially, they say, come here if you want nectar, and the insects just follow their lead. These visual guides are also directing the insect right over the plant's reproductive structures, where the creature will either get dusted with pollen or drop some pollen off from the last flower he visited. When you look at a flower, we think of it as just an object of beauty, an object of some grace and charm, but really it's purely a sexual object. The petals and the really showy parts are really just attractants or, or guides. The real business parts of the flowers are down towards the center of the plant, and it's a group of structures known as stamens and pistils. The male parts of a plant are the stamens, often elegant extensions that offer their pollen equivalent to sperm up to the world. The female parts of a plant are the pistils, a sticky surface that receives the pollen. The job, of course, of pollen is to get from the male parts of one flower to the female part of another flower. And when this is done successfully, fertilization occurs, and you have the potential to create a whole new individual. guarantee that the transfer of pollen that happens effectively, most plants tend to live in colonies, you know, big groups of the same kind, and they flower all around the same time. And of course in your garden the best approach is to plant in clumps, so you do have a big colony of one kind of plant, so that when the pollinator comes in, it goes from flower to flower to flower of the same plant and prevents the transfer of pollen to different species and makes it more efficient. Flowers are beauty with a purpose. Their bright colors, exotic shapes, and heady fragrances are there for one reason and one reason only, to lure other creatures into becoming players in their sexual games. Lots of flowers are quite large relative to their sexual structures because they want to make sure they put on a big display that can't be missed from a distance. But also sometimes they have a telltale shape that says to a prospective pollinator, come to me and you're more likely to get a good reward. For example, tubular flowers often can't be fed on by certain kinds of short-tongued insects. But insects with long tongues or creatures like hummingbirds with long bills will be attracted to tubular flowers because they recognize that shape as a place where they know they can get nectar. It'll still be there for them. Midsummer, at the height of the growing season, that's when there's the most competition. There's just a massive array of plants flowering, and what they're all trying to do is scream out to the pollinators, like the neon lights at a Las Vegas strip, saying, come here, come here, come here. Don't go to them, come to me. So they have to compete 
by providing more nectar, huge displays of color and shape and exotic fragrances and things like that because they're trying to get the attention of a limited number of pollinators. The design of each bloom in the garden is perfectly specialized to attract the plant's ideal pollinator. Flowers want the right pollinator. They customize their shapes, sizes, and scents to lure in the chosen ones and keep out the riffraff. The fox club is especially attractive to bumblebees. It has a landing pad for the bumblebee to alight on before heading in for a drink. Other flowers specialize in using butterflies as pollinators. One of the things that distinguishes a butterfly from other kinds of insects is it has a very long tongue or proboscis that can probe deep into the nectaries of a flower, reaching down the long tubular corolla that really no other insect can do very well. And with each taste of the sweet stuff, she gets dusted with pollen, some of which the plant hopes she'll take on to its neighbor. As in most species, cross-pollination leads to new combinations of genes. So the aim of most plants is to share their pollen with their neighbors to improve their chances for success in future generations. Survival is the name of the game, and some tight, tight relationships have developed between plants and insects trying to survive in the competitive marketplace of the garden. Bottle gentians have forged a strong and exclusive bond with bumblebees. They keep their pollen locked away under wraps that only a bumblebee can unlock. And that's because nobody else has the power to pry open their tightly closed petals and find the treasure trove of pollen lying at their center. This kind of niche marketing, however, does come with some risk. If bumblebee populations are low, or if there's too many other nectar sources available, the plant could be setting itself up to become an evolutionary dead end. That is, it won't be passing any genes on to the next generation. be even more devious in the way they manipulate insects into acting as their sexual go-betweens. In the case of Lobelia cardinalis, or cardinal flowers, the upper petals of the flower actually have their reproductive parts kind of dangling down over where the hummingbird's head will have to be in order for it to feed at the flower. So as the hummingbird extends its beak into the flower tube, it causes the pollen-bearing part of the flower to dip down and dust pollen onto the head and feathers of the hummingbird. So as it moves on to the next plant, it can't help but transfer pollen as it goes. Some flowers aren't quite as subtle in their approach as Lobelia cardinalis. Milkweeds have quite beautiful, almost orchid-shaped flowers in tight clusters. And what they do is attract a fairly large variety of insect pollinators. But the ones that are most effective as pollinators are the ones with long, thin legs. Because as they feed, it's a little difficult to get purchase on the flowers. Their feet move around a bit. And the next thing you know, it slips down into a little groove between adjacent petals. When it tries to pull out of this groove, it snags a little kind of filament which has attached to it two little sacks of pollen. And now it's firmly attached so that when the wasp flies off and goes to the next flower, it can't help but drag the pollen along with it.
Now, plant pollination schemes are not foolproof. Sometimes, insects bypass these scams and steal the pollen on their own terms. You may think of this as a single flower, but really it's made up of hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny individual flowers, all clustered together in a single head. Now there must be some advantage to being clustered in large numbers like this because composites have become extremely successful. They've spread all over the planet. And if you watch closely a patch of composites in bloom, what you'll see is they're covered in pollinators that slowly work their way around the flowers, feeding on the nectar on each individual one, and picking up pollen on the way. Lots of plants are able to use more than one kind of pollinator. Sometimes they're really quite promiscuous. They'll use many, many pollinators and dupe them all into the same game. These often have very wide, open-faced flowers, often with the nectaries exposed like little pools so that insects can just crawl along the surface of the flower and dip their tongues into the nectaries. Flowers like this are especially good at attracting pollinators with short tongues, so many of the flies and bees actually have quite short tongues and can't reach into deep, long-tubed flowers. So it pays to be more available. But it also means that these plants have very long flowering times. So what they have is continuous flowering going on, maybe over six weeks. And so that when you look at a clump of cone flowers, for example, different parts of the flower will be in bloom at different times, but they guarantee that at some point that plant will in fact be pollinated because there's a reason for bees or flies to go back there over the course of many, many weeks. To clinch it, to make sure that they do in fact attract insects, plants often don't just leave it to the visual cues they'll use all the ammunition available in their arsenal to draw those insects in. They use things like fragrance to attract insects as well. Sweet perfumey smells, volatile compounds that disperse easily in the atmosphere and can draw in insects from fairly wide areas. And these sweet smells are really, again, a form of advertising. They're saying, if you come to the source of this smell, you'll get nectar. The other thing that some flowers do to select out some insects over others is to provide different kinds of nectar. So for example, they may have nectar that is rich in sucrose, that's like our white table sugar, and that attracts certain kinds of insects that like those tastes. Other plants actually produce nectar which is rich in amino acids, and the amino acids may attract things like hummingbirds or flies that are using that as a major component of their diet. Some plants actually are trying to attract pollinators that aren't interested in sweet smells or even nectar. For example, if they're trying to attract flies, the best thing to try and imitate is something dead and rotting. So in fact, some plants like trilliums, red trilliums in particular, produce smells that really are just like rotting meat. And lo and behold, in come the flies and pollinate the plant. Not all plants, of course, produce flowers. In fact, the earliest plants, and many of them are still very successful today, don't do sex in the same way at all. Sex for ferns is not like it is for flowering plants. Ferns are actually primitive things that were here long before the flowering plants. What they do is they produce spores here on the underside of their fronds. These spores then go on to germinate and produce the male and female parts, which need water to be able to get together. This, of course, limits the success of ferns. They can really only live in the damp or shady parts of your garden. Thank you.
Plants generally fall into two categories, annuals and perennials. Annuals are plants that complete their entire life cycle in one growing season. That means they've got to grow like crazy, produce as many seeds as they possibly can, and die. Perennials have to take a different tact, however. They're going to try to meter out their energy and resources over the years. Each year they're going to flower, produce a pretty large number of seeds if they can, and then save just enough of themselves to last through another winter so they can do the whole process over again. Plants are capable of manipulating lots of creatures besides just insects. Fruit-bearing plants look to a whole other set of creatures to spread their seed. They marshal all their resources to create fruit, precious seeds wrapped up in a tasty packaging. Fruit lovers like birds, raccoons, and even this groundhog will eat the fruit and distribute the seeds about the garden in their droppings. As the beauty of the ferns and flowers fades, some plants hold out for a wind and a prayer. Some plants will produce as much seed as they can and wait for just the right moment to toss them to the wind. The final act in an ephemeral life. <laughs> 